There's a table that you've prepared for me In the presence of my enemies It's your body and your blood you shed for me This is how I fight my battles There's a table
mountains, break the walls apart, open the heavens, almighty God you are, overcomer, defender of my heart. gathered about me you can be sure that I'm going to be there Jesus is in the midst his power is here and his presence is here this is an hour of breakthrough no doubt about it we will leave different than we walked in those doors amen Lord we thank you for a great worship team, a great team of text father that helped get the word out. And Lord, we just uh, thank you most of all for being in our presence. And we love you and we glorify your name, Jesus, because it's all about you. We live, we breathe for you. And we bless you in Jesus name. Amen. I tell you, before you're seated, turn around, greet somebody. 
Hello Facebook. Our uh, teams are being dismissed at this time. Good to see you, Mike. <laughs> I know, buddy. I got you, John. I tell you, as you can see, our ushers have already made their way to the front, and uh, thank you for that. Um, when it comes to giving, this church is absolutely the best. Thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, we just love you. We just love you so much. You know, God does so much through us collectively as a congregation. It is, it's amazing. It is amazing. Fellas, you can receive the offering. I do have a few announcements that I want to make. Um, this coming Thursday night, citywide prayer at Ambassadors for Christ Worship Center. It's right down here on Alligator Road, and that's at 7 o'clock uh, this coming Thursday night. Who knows what it is in two weeks? Easter. Easter. I tell you. Easter. Make plans to be here in two weeks on April the 9th at 10 a.m. for an Easter celebration. And it is going to be that. We're going to be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How many of you are glad he's alive? Amen. That's right. Amen. Amen. Because he's alive, we can live. Oh, abundantly. And he says it. You know, I was thinking about that scripture. If we're here about him and he's sure going to be here, he went through hell to get to you. Literally, you think he's going to miss out on the opportunity to get to be with us? I don't think so. Mm, that's wonderful. Also, on that day, our kids will be having an Easter celebration as well. And uh, they're going to be doing all kinds of fun stuff over there. They're going to be taking home some prizes. Got about a thousand eggs they can go find. But they're going to learn about Jesus and what it means to be alive in Jesus that day. So, be here for that. Uh, I have here a flyer. We have these on the back table. Be sure to get one on your way out if you already do not have one. But it's the Citywide Encounter Conference coming up on April the 27th and 28th at 6.30 p.m. I think tickets are $25 to get in on those days. And they even have something. If you can't afford it, you can scan and get a free ticket. But this is... Um, Mr. Jolly and Miss Margaret's ministry. We want to be a support and a blessing to them. It's going to be a time of deliverance and of worship and of prayer and of preaching the word. And uh, it will be two days that you will not want to miss. And uh, I can guarantee you will be encouraged and lifted up uh, at those meetings. Oh, that's wonderful. I tell you, before Pastor Carl comes and uh, brings the word, are you excited about the word today? I am too. Yes, um, Miss Brenda has an important announcement. Brenda has an important announcement to make. Come on up. Come on up. Let me give you the mic. Let me give you the mic.
gold means a lot of things to a lot of different people. And that in, in our day, in the Pentecostal Holiness Church, that meant a week of services. But this revival, I believe, that God was speaking to me about is about our personal revival in our hearts. And I don't, there's never been a time, we've pastored 36 years, and I don't think there's ever been a time that I remember more people anxious, depressed, alone, afraid of the future, but I believe we are born again, we have God on our side, and no matter what, he will take care of us. He's going to do that for us. And this was a dangerous day to put me up here because I'm telling you what, whoo, he did something in me this morning. And I just believe, I know it's a sacrifice, ladies. I know it is because you're all busy and you all have things that you need to do. But I believe if you will give this hour tonight from five to six, God's going to refresh you. You will leave here refreshed, renewed, regrouped, recharged, and you're going to experience a personal revival in your life. Life. I believe that. It brought back to, to me a devotional that I read just a couple of days ago. Hear the voice of your Savior welcoming you into a place where grace flows. Lord, do we need grace more than ever. Where the Spirit refuels us, where mercy fixes what has been strained and stressed by the accumulation of life's pressures. If you've had any pressures, holler out, amen. amen. This is the space where priorities and relationships that have been pushed out of alignment are in need of repair and will get patched up and recalibrated. I believe that's gonna happen tonight. I believe it's going to be fresh. And the word says, they that wait on the Lord shall what? Renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run, they will not be weary. They will walk and they will not faint. God has something special for you tonight. Please come and receive the word. Thank you. I think me and Pastor Carl's coming. <laughs> girl <laughs> and I believe there's going to be child care and nursery provided uh, tonight too for you ladies let me just ask if I'm in the right room anybody here and it's okay to say oh me anybody here dealing with any problems in your life oh me okay I'm in the right room then the word of the Lord today is designed to lower your blood pressure. Make life a lot easier for those of us who deal with problems of every description. I want to begin with one verse. Jesus spoke these words in the Gospel of John, chapter 16 and verse 24. Jesus said this, until now, you have asked, nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. I want to speak this morning about exchanging your problem for God's peace. Now, Jesus is alive. We're celebrating resurrection in a couple of weeks, but uh, he is alive and among his people, and can you only imagine if Jesus were to walk up to you in a form that would be visible and he would speak audibly and say to you, one-on-one, -on -one, Jesus and you, 
If he were to say, up until now, you've not asked for anything in my name, but ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. Now, there are some things that God will do for us if we ask that he may not do for us if we don't ask. And I'm talking about the difference prayer can make in the life of a believer. Prayer is that place to where we come to God, we acknowledge the weight of the burdens and the problems that we may be carrying, and it's in that place as we persevere in prayer that the divine exchange occurs. At some point in our intimate encounters with God, he takes from us the weight of the problems of the world, and he replaces our problems with his peace and his joy. Now, only God knows how much is in his hands that could be in our hands if we would only ask. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 35, it says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Now, I would like to rebut, if I could, with limitations, I'll restrain myself, but to that point that Jesus found a solitary place. It was just him and the Father, and he prayed all night long. My argument would be, if I had one, if there's anybody that does not need to pray all night long, I think it would be Jesus. But prayer was so critical, it was so important, to the relationship he had with the Father that he spent all night long on more than one occasion by himself. All of us, me, you, all of us, need a solitary place to where it's just God and us. And we need to exchange our problems in that meeting, give him our problems and receive his peace in their place. He continued all night in prayer. Now, Jesus modeled a lifestyle of prayer. I heard it said many years ago, and I've never forgotten, this is what Jesus really did during his earthly ministry. He went from one place of prayer to another place of prayer and performed miracles in between. He did it over and over again, but his lifestyle was a lifestyle of prayer. In Luke chapter 11, in verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. How impressed were the disciples with Jesus' prayer life? We have no record in the Gospels to where the disciples, those who followed him most closely, ever came up to him and said, Hmm, I like what you just did. Can you teach us how to take a pot of water and turn it into wine? like you just did? Nowhere in the Gospels do we have a record where the disciples came up to him and said, I just saw you open that blind man's eyes. Can you teach us how to open blind eyes? Nobody asked him. They saw him cast out devils. They saw him heal the sick. They saw him even raise the dead, and they never asked him to teach them how he raised the dead, 
even though I'm sure they were quite impressed with all of the above, but they were so impressed with his prayer life that they asked him, Lord, if you're going to teach us anything, teach us how you pray. That's how impressed they were with his lifestyle of prayer. And the prayer is not just speaking to God. We've minimized it. We've boiled it down to that, and we're being robbed if we do. Prayer is speaking to God and also hearing from him. Now, Jesus adopted that principle for his own life in prayer. He would go to the solitary place, that certain place where he and God the Father were alone, sometimes all night long in prayer, and he would leave that place and come and speak to the people, and he would say, I only speak what I've heard my Father say. So prayer is more than just us giving God a laundry list of things that's wrong that we want you to make right for us. Prayer is also hearing from God so that when we speak, we say what we've heard him say. If you're only talking to God in your prayer closet and never listening, then you'll never come out of that place of prayer being able to say, I'm only saying to you what I've already heard my father say in my secret place with him. And Jesus said, and I don't understand it all, but that's what faith's about. Faith doesn't require you to understand everything in order to believe. And Jesus said to his disciples, your father knows exactly what you need even before you pray. But then he says, but ask. He already knows exactly. When you're praying, you're not informing him of anything he's not already aware of. He already knows. But he still says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find knock and the door will be open. And then he says, for everyone. Do you believe every word in the Bible is important? He said, for everyone who asks, receives. Now, there have been times I've gone to God and asked for something. And he answered every time. Sometimes the answer was yes. Sometimes the answer was no. And sometimes the answer was, wait, not just yet, so wait. But in spite of the fact that he already knows exactly what we need, before we ask, he invites us, he instructs us, ask anyway. Seek and knock, and it will be opened unto you. Now, I want to quickly cover a few blockages to answered prayer. Some reasons our prayers may not get above the ceiling, and all of us know what that feels like. The first one is in the book of James chapter 4. It simply says, you have not because you ask not. It's important to ask. Obviously, it's very biblical. Jesus taught it over and over and over again, and then he did some explaining about it and some clarifying so we would clearly understand that we should ask him for our needs to be met. And the biggest reason probably that we don't receive more from the Lord is that we simply do not ask him for more. How sad is that? Now, Hannah in the Old Testament was a good woman. She was a God-fearing woman, married to a good man, and yet she was barren, and she was unable to have a child. 
and the desire of her heart was she wanted a son. I'm declaring to you today that even though Hannah was bar a barren, she conceived a son for one reason, because she asked God for one. In the Old Testament, Elisha was a prophet with a long list of miracles to his credit. But Elisha received a double portion of Elijah's anointing for one reason, because he asked for it. Jesus met the woman at the well, a woman of a different race, a different gender. There were all kinds of lines he crossed in that conversation according to the culture of their day. And he asked her for water and she called him out on it and said, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. You're a man, I'm a woman. We're here in the middle of town at the public well. We shouldn't even be talking. You shouldn't be asking me for water. And Jesus said to her, if you only knew who is asking you for water, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. If you'd like a new phrase to rehearse over and over and over in your spirit, multiple times every waking hour for quite a while, let it be this phrase, you would have asked him and he would have given you. You would have asked him and he would have given you. You would have asked him and he would have given you. That was the message he preached to that woman at the well. The biggest reason we don't receive more is we ask not. That's not a tornado, is it? Okay. It's just a good rain. Lord, I thank you for washing the car and pressure washing the house. Even now while we're worshiping, he's being good to us out there. Other reasons we do not receive more from the Lord is doubt and unbelief. In the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, it says Jesus was on his journey going through villages, and he would come to certain villages, and it would say this about those specific communities. It would say Jesus could do no mighty work there because of their unbelief. Now, you can know the Lord. You can be uh, faithful even to church. Uh, you can help the little old lady across the street and still struggle with doubt and unbelief in some areas. That will limit God. He can't do very much when we're in doubt and unbelief. Doubt is the curse of uncertainty. Doubt is hearing a word from God and thinking, well, maybe so, maybe not. It's doubt. And then we play mind games with different words like, oh, I wish and oh, I would hope. But doubt is the curse of uncertainty when we should hear the word of God as our absolute authority, and the ultimate truth. Unbelief means this. You were not convinced. You did not agree. And you didn't even try. That's unbelief. So doubt and unbelief. Can you the powerful son of God, all powerful, he could perform miracles of every description, but when he was around people that were committed to doubt and unbelief, even the most powerful son of God that he was could do no mighty works. And then one gospel writer said, well, except he did heal a few 
minor illnesses, a headache maybe, but no great mighty miracles. Not because he didn't have the power, but because the people were cursed with uncertainty of doubt. They were not convinced he could. They did not agree that he would, and they didn't even try. Let's not camp out at the intersection of doubt and unbelief. How do we cure our doubt and unbelief? Well, the opposite of that is faith, and faith comes as we hear the Word of God. If you had a faith monitor right now, like some of you have your little Apple watches, and it tells you how many steps you take, and uh, what your pulse is, and what your blood pressure, and what the stock market's doing, and whatever else. But if you had a faithometer, even right now, you would be aware, if you watched it, that your faith is increasing. My faith is increasing right now. Because we are hearing the Word of God. Romans 10, 17, faith comes and faith increases as we hear the Word of God. Faith does not require sight, but it does require hearing. God may be invisible, but he is not silent. And our faith rises when we hear God's Word. The problem is some people, even some who believe in God, have drifted out of earshot of his voice. They're so far out of range, they can't hear that gentle whisper because they have moved and they can't hear. God is not silent and faith does not require that you see, but faith does come as we hear the word of God. Now, in James chapter 1, beginning at verse 5, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask. Let him ask. How simple is that? Sometimes we're thrown off by the simplicity. Uh, I would think in my natural mind, if my mind had not been renewed to the Word of God, and thankfully... Uh, we're a work in pro progress. We're learning to agree with God on everything. Lord, change my mind on everything where you and I don't already agree. But my natural mind would be limited to think, well, if I, if I lack wisdom, then uh, I probably need to uh, go get a degree in some subject because I'll learn a lot. And that's good. Or my natural mind would be, well, if I, if I lack wisdom, then I probably need to find me a mentor and a guru. And that's good, at least the mentor part. I'd, I'd check out the guru before you go too far with that. But, but no, how simple is this? If any, if any of you lack wisdom, the answer is simply ask. God for it. Let him ask of God. But now this is how important it is to ask in faith without the curse of uncertainty, doubt, without unbelief, leaving you not convinced, you don't agree and you don't even try. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. If you doubt, like a wave on the sea, wherever the wind blows, that's the direction the wave is going to turn. The stronger the wind is, the bigger the wave will become. It has it's on mind. It goes where the wind wants to take it. We have no say-so over the way the waves of the sea are driven and tossed. We can't go to God and ask for anything, wisdom or anything else, if we're a doubter like that. Then the Word says, For let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. Uh, I don't care about how big your problem is or how small it might be. You're going to deal with it and you're going to carry it 
until you make a divine exchange in a place of prayer and by faith you give God your problem and by faith, no doubting, you say, I'm going to take your peace instead of my problem. Amen. It's available, but if you're tossed like a wave of the sea up and down, maybe so, maybe not, cursed with uncertainty and doubt, not convinced, don't agree, don't even try to work with God on it with your faith. Don't let that man think he'll receive anything at all from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable, not just in this one way right here, unstable in all his ways. I believe every word in the Bible is there for a reason, and that word all has a purpose for being there. He's unstable, not just in this one area where God and my problem is right here. I want so much uh, to lose the weight of this problem. I, I want to give it to you, and I'd rather you give me your peace to take its place. But I'm unstable, not only in this, but in all my ways. That's what a double-minded man is. That's a person who thinks uh, they're a man or a woman of faith on Sunday morning, and then they're a doubter and an unbeliever for the rest of the week. Oh, no, I did not mean to say that. I'm offending somebody right now. Lord, I'm sorry if I offended anybody right here and now. Now, uh, I'm kidding, but it reminds me I went to a pastor's conference 30 years ago, and uh, there was the speaker there. He spoke for two or three nights in a row. He was the keynote speaker. He, he was uneducated. Uh, but full of the power of God. Now, I'm all right with education as long as it doesn't diminish the power of God available to us. But he was an uneducated man from Louisiana. And he didn't use perfect English. And, and uh, he got up and he preached hard. I mean, we were all pastors. and I mean, he just raked us all over. Uh, we had to laugh a little or else we would have cried. And and he preached hard. I'll, can I just tell you some of the things? I don't advocate for all he said, but this was where he was. And he even preached, said, you pastors, if you have health insurance, you're not trusting. I don't have any health insurance. I trust Jesus to be my healer. I'm not paying for health insurance. No, I'm not advocating that. I have some health insurance myself. My primary insurance is uh, uh, Jesus the healer, but uh, we live in a natural world, and so, but that was him. So when the conference, when he had finished his last sermon, he reminded me of in the book of Acts to where it said uh, uh, the judges or whoever the authorities were, the people of God had come before them, and the Bible says they were uneducated, but we knew they had been with Jesus. This man was like that. And when he finished his final sermon on the last night of the conference and turned uh, the service over to Bishop Houston Miles to conclude the conference, he goes and stands over there. It wasn't about 30 seconds, this evangelist, preacher, uneducated Louisiana man came back to the pulpit and said to Bishop Miles, oh, can I say one more thing? And Bishop Miles said, sure, go ahead. And we were all saying, oh, dude. <laughs> he said, sincerely, he said, look, I've enjoyed being with you these two or three days and preaching to you great group of pastors, and I just need to say before I leave, if I've stepped on your toes, if I've offended you, if I've insulted you in any way, Praise God, that's what I came to do. <laughs> I thought, well, <laughs> here's a man who's sticking true to his brand. I mean, you're not going to get him off point. <laughs> He's one I'll never forget. That's for sure. I forgot his name, it don't matter. 
But no, I don't mean to offend anybody. <laughs> That's where I'm going with that. I don't mean to insult or offend anybody. <clears throat> and then one other reason we don't receive more from God is asking for the wrong thing. Now, first, we, we, we have not because we ask not. Then we uh, don't receive because of our own doubt and unbelief. And now we can see in Scripture we sometimes don't receive from God because we're asking for the wrong thing. John 15 and 7, Jesus said these words, if you abide in me, that's not if you visit with me. That is if you live in me, if you abide permanently in me, and my words abide in you. You will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. So the word of God dwelling in us, and Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of God dwell richly in you. And I like the way it says, you will ask what you desire. Because when the word of God is alive, if you're living in the word and the word is alive in you consistently, then desires will change and you will get to the place, I will get to the place to where I won't even ask or desire something that God doesn't want from me. So sometimes we ask and don't receive because we're asking for uh, the wrong thing. And then another reason we don't receive more from God is we're asking for the wrong reason or with the wrong motive. James chapter 4 and verse 3 says, You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. The New Living Translation says your motives are all wrong. The Passion Translation says you have corrupt motives. And the Amplified Translation says you have an unrighteous agenda. So no, we're not going to receive what we ask for if our motive is wrong. And then in Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 6, it says be anxious for nothing and our Modern terminology, we could say it this way. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer, here we go again, the place of prayer, that place where we can exchange our problems for God's peace. In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. If we prayed a little more, we would worry a little less. And then the next verse, verse 7, here it is. Now we're praying. Instead of worrying about the problems we're dealing with in prayer, we make it known to God. The next verse says, the exchange comes and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There it is. You give God, don't worry about it, just give it to him. You find that place in prayer and you cast the care over on the Lord and then the peace of God comes. That's trading our problems for God's peace. I say this, if you have a problem, and we all do, pray until the peace shows up. Prayer is trading your problem for God's peace. Pray until the peace shows up. I'm closing with this. This should be our prayer. God, I'll give you my problem if you'll give me your peace. I got faith for that. I mean, I've just read in the Word. I've just... Uh, read multiple promises from God's Word that confirms he wants to answer that prayer. God, I'll give you my problem if you'll give me your peace. Would you stand with me, please? The prayer team is coming. Ruthie Hancock and the men and women who serve you, the body of Christ, by praying a prayer of agreement with you and speaking the Word of the Lord over your life for whatever need you may have, in just a moment, you'll have opportunity to come and receive prayer. But say this out loud after me. God, God I'll, give you my problem I'll give you my problem 
if you'll give me your peace. Let's say it all together again. God, I'll give you my problem if you'll give me your peace. Do you receive it this morning? Would you bow your heads, please? Let's consecrate the altar here. Needs are going to be ministered to and met in just a moment. Father, thank you for the word of the Lord that speaks life and direction to your people. Thank you that right now our faith is higher than it was at 10 o'clock when the service began because we have worshipped you with scripture and we've heard the word of the Lord. And there are men and women here carrying real problems. They can leave problem free and full of your peace. We sanctify this altar now. May it be the place, may it be the place where problems are exchanged for the peace of God. And we thank you that you've instructed us to let the peace of God rule and reign in our hearts. And that can begin even now in prayer. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. You're dismissed, but if you need prayer for any, anything in your life, come and receive prayer. God bless you.